Mr. Secretary of the Department of Children and Family, Mr. Chief Operating Officer of Florida State Government, the titles are growing. <laughs> In any case, Mr. Secretary, welcome back to Capital Dateline. Well, great. Thanks for, thanks for having me back. I'd like to say congratulations to you on your recent appointment by Governor Scott to this new job of Chief Operating Officer for Florida State Government. We're going to come back and talk about that a little bit later. But you and I had a chance uh, a, a while back mm -hmm. as you were entering into the service in this position uh, with, as Secretary of DCF to talk about what many people consider as one of the most challenging jobs in state government about what you were hoping to do and hoping to uh, accomplish. Um, looking back on it now, uh, what, as you look back, were a couple of the most vivid uh, events so far in your experience? Well, when I first came in uh, about 15 months or so ago, you know, literally in the, the second, third week uh, that I was here, you know, I, we encountered the, uh, just a horrible tragedy in Miami with uh, Nubia Barahona's murder and, and um, uh, at, coming through that process was a whole collection of uh, issues about how we performed child protective investigations and, and that situation really uncovered a lot of flaws. And for me, uh, you know, that was in a very emotional time as I, you know, all of a sudden realized, uh, you know, this is a lot different than running a business uh, and dealing with people's lives and, and uh, the implications of how we run the business and how it affects so many people. And, you know, so and through that process, it was it was an opportunity, opportunity to learn the business real quick uh, in terms of what we do. And it, but it really helped build the framework for a lot of the initiatives that we have launched since then. You know, you still referred to it as a business. Right. You know, I think a lot of people would find that a little bit odd uh, when you think about a state agency that is in that business. But how would you define uh, what the major outputs of the, the business of the Department of Children and Family might be? Well, uh, DCF really three major components, uh, all of which are pretty integrated. There, there's the child welfare system which is about protecting children and then uh, when we have to remove children from homes, uh, establishing uh, you know, their, their life in foster care. There's the whole substance abuse mental health programs which uh, you know, provide services to those in need, which has lots of relationships to people who are in child welfare, and so there's a lot of relationships. And then the third, which is all the, the in essence, the social services programs, the, the food stamp programs and the uh, uh, TANF programs and uh, related Medicaid eligibility and those types of programs. And so, you know, uh, they all deal with very similar populations and sometimes people go across all three of those programs. And the, the common issue is, you know, how do we provide services to help those most in need? And then how do we help them, uh, in essence, uh, you know, get the independence that they need in order to get off, uh, in essence, uh, state services? Uh, the department has, I think, 13,000 or so employees and a budget of $3 billion. Um, you've been all over the world uh, and all over the United States uh, in your private sector career as a management consultant, uh, not only with business, businesses, but also with uh, government agencies. Uh, this is a big job. This is a huge job um, that this agency has. A after you were there several months, did some things kind of come up and boil up to the surface? You said, you know, there are three or four things that we've got to do better. Well, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> quite, quite a few. Uh, you know, probably the, the most dawning point is, you know, we can't fix the problem. Uh, there's just, there's not enough money, there's not enough people, uh, and there's um, um, too complicated, the issues are too complicated that, you know, individual programs will, will solve the needs of the, the communities in, in our state. And so, you know, I think that was probably the most eye-opening point from my perspective was, 
we, ha we have to figure out how to do the programs we can do the most efficient way that we can deliver those services in the smartest way and get the biggest return on our investment and how we do them. But probably even more importantly is, you know, how do we engage with the communities in, in our state to really partner with us on dealing with these issues? Because if we continue to try to attack those sort of as a, as a siloed government, I'm here from the government, I'm here to help uh, type mentality, then I don't think we'll ever make the progress that we need to make. So you needed some arms and legs, really some partners out there because you can't do it alone from Tallahassee is, right. is the message that you're giving. That's right. um, how did you reach out to those communities and to those local partnerships? Well, I, I think a lot of that has been evolving over the years. Uh, you know, there's lots of communities across the state that, um, you know, are very engaged in, in helping our, deliver our social services. One of the areas that I've been very focused on is, is really reaching out much more aggressively to the faith-based communities, you know, uh, throughout the state in terms of uh, the role that they can play. And over the years, we've made it very difficult for a lot of those organizations to, to work with state government. We, we created there our own set of barriers and bureaucracies that, that complicated that process. So we, we've been trying to simplify some of those activities so that we can get more and more people engaged in, in helping our children and helping those in need. Talk about some of those barriers. You hear about that a lot, not only in your uh, agency, but across state government. Yeah. Give us some examples of some barriers that just didn't make any sense to you in trying to establish those community partnerships. Well, one of the most obvious ones is is in foster care, and uh, you know, with with our children that are in foster care, you know, over the years we just created a lot of rules about uh, what you what a child can and cannot do uh, at being in, in foster care, and because of some of those rules, others can't get engaged and to to help kids. So, for instance. Uh, you know, if a child wants to go spend the night at someone's house, you know, that, that person's house they're going to needs to have a background check. Uh, done every on, single time. Uh, every single time. And, um, and so, and if somebody else wants to help a kid, you know, that person has to go be screened uh, separately. And so, you know, people from the church or from community organizations who want to mentor a child or, or uh, you know, help them and do homework or, or help them deal with some of the needs they may have, it, they, it's very complicated if they have to go through all these uh, processes to just be qualified to, to, to help a child. That's not what a, 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 kid in foster, a kid who's not in foster care would have to go through. And, uh, and it just, in essence, uh, makes a lot of organizations recognize that hey, this is too hard. And so, so we've, we've been trying to simplify a lot of those kind of rules so that more and more people can get engaged in helping our kids be successful. So what did you do to correct that particular problem? Well, that particular problem was uh, simply uh, eliminating that rule that, uh, you know, um, uh, babysitters and, and sleepovers are, do not require uh, background checks. You know, we've, we've done some other changes, for instance, uh, just recently we uh, allow, are now allowing all foster kids to have access to Facebook. Uh, I have teenage children, you, you do too, and we, we know, you know, all teenagers have to have Facebook now. <laughs> it's a way of life. And, uh, and so, you know, our kids need to, to feel that, you know, they're as normal as any other kid, and they need to have all the same rights and privileges that, that any kid uh, has today going through the school. Well, um, the last time we talked, you hadn't gone through your first legislative session yet, but now uh, you've just gone through the 2012 legislative session, and um, you had to have time to build up some knowledge of what you were going to ask for in the 2012 session. What were your priorities going into the 2012 session? Well, we, we had a, a, a set of priorities about trying to continue to improve the efficiency of our agency. Uh, we needed some investment uh, dollars to, to drive some of those efficiencies. And then the probably the most important area that we focused on was going back to, I mentioned the, the Miami uh, a murder and, and the, the Barahona investigation that we went through. Uh, we identified uh, some dramatic improvements that we needed to make in how we do child protective investigations. And um, we, we brought a very complete package uh, that defined sort of redefining how the worker performs their job. We redefined the process and procedures and we asked for some additional investment money to in essence improve that process so that our investigation process can be uh, much more efficient, much more timely, and uh, children will be better protected. How did you fare? 
Well, I, you know, I believe the legislature uh, are, uh, understood our issues, and uh, you know, we, we they granted us the money we asked for. Uh, you know, this money is actually going to be um, uh, paying workers more money uh, in, in several situations as we've created more of a career model for the investigator. We're going to empower them with better tools and technologies so that they have better information to make decisions. And, and, uh, and then one of the most complicated things that we have with investigators is just the enormous caseloads. And so we have to create a an, an operation that in essence allows uh, the workers to deal with a fewer caseloads and be able to process those caseloads much quicker so that we can you know handle all the the volume of uh, investigations that talk we have. about specifically the volume a little bit I don't think people probably have any notion of how what the volume is for investigators or case workers uh, in Florida right now well, it's just uh, it's a horrid thought uh, when you think about it, and um, you know we have uh, over four hundred thousand uh, uh, identi identified abuse cases that are reported to us a year. Four hundred. Four hundred thousand, and so you know you you look back and you say you know. How could a state have that many investigations of abuse? Now, not all of those are, are you know, turn into uh, you know formal cases that we have to investigate. But that's the volume that comes through our 1-800 abuse hotline that we then launch investigations and we send out investigators to look into that situation and determine what has happened. And so, you know, when, when you look at those kinds of issues, you know, you, you really have to have a very industrialized business process to, to handle that kind, kind of volume. And then you also got to really look at what's the root cause? Why, why are we having, you know, that, that, that type of volume in, in the state? 